So I think we'll just start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Malloy, uh, and I'll present uh, a new algorithm and protocol that was uh, introduced into uh, Tipsy in Linux 4.7, that is June last year. Uh, what is particular with this algorithm is, is that it allows uh, to monitor neighboring nodes in a cluster. It allows to increase that number with a factor of 10 at least, from around 100 to up to 1,000, and maybe more. We haven't tested anything more. Uh, I think I'll start with a brief interrupt and just explain what TIPS is, because I'm not sure everybody here will be is aware about what, about what it is. So TIPS is an cross-node IPC mechanism that was introduced into uh, Linux about 10 years ago. It comes from the teleco, uh, telecom world, and its main user base until this day has been telco applications, which back then were supposed to have special requirements and things. And uh, to this day, the main base has been this kind of uh, applications and telco companies in general, telco world. Uh, I should still say that I consider this to have a much wider potential usage. I'll go back to that. So uh, over the last few years, I and some co-workers have spent a significant effort to improving the code base, modernizing it, and uh, make it, making it more attractive for uh, the general audience that we hope can be, make use of this. Um, I should also mention that when I'm saying that using the word, the word cluster throughout this presentation, I don't mean anything particular with that. It's, in this context, it just means a group of nodes where all members of that group want to tightly monitor its neighbors. Uh, so why do we want to monitor neighboring nodes at all? Well, I would say in our world, it's two main purposes. First of all, uh, you want to, typically you want to have all connections to a failing node or a node who, which comes, becomes unavailable. You want to have those aborted as soon as possible, not within minutes or within hours that is typical now, but really within, at the second level and even faster if possible. And uh, that is the first task. The second task is that Typically, in clusters, there are cluster managers, there might be group protocols, there might be other users who are interested in, in um, keeping track of which nodes are available at any moment. A generic service, you can say. And we want this to happen ASAP, so within a well-defined short interval. So if you look at common solutions I have seen, I would rather call them naive solutions, but I have seen them used. One simple solution is to just, you speed up the connections, uh, keep a live timer to some ridiculous high level, second level, sub-second level. And this works. You get what you want. The connection is aborted if the peer becomes unavailable. But what happens if, which you in reality have, have thousands of such connections, or tens of thousands even? What happens is you, the CPU load and even the network load generated by this the supervision becomes, goes out of hand, simply because uh, it, it increases by linearly by the number of connections. And uh, so this is not a sustainable solution for and a generic solution to this problem. And apart from, apart from that, this does not provide any neighbor monitoring service, as was the second task I listed on the previous slide. Uh, the second solution, the second, the generic solution, uh, generic service, is about what I've seen being done there is that people typically set up a, a, a daemon on each cluster node and let each of those daemons um, establish a connection to all the other daemons in a full mesh pattern, full mesh pattern. and then they, they uh, use the keep alive timer or some other monitoring mechanism to keep track of it. This works. It gives the service you want if you let others subscribe to the service. Uh, the problem with this, of course, you might have false positives. What if this daemon crashes or becomes unresponsive while all the rest of that node is working fine? So you have problems there. A uh, more serious problem is that um, this doesn't scale much beyond around 100 nodes. All experience shows that. Then both CPU load but above all network load becomes overwhelming. 
This is because um, uh, the CPU load to maintain a number of timers, that increases linearly with the number of nodes. But the traffic, the network traffic, increases with, because each node is monitoring in an N node cluster, N minus one neighbors, it increases by square of N, square of the size of the clusters. So all experience shows we cannot use this pattern for more than about 100 nodes. And uh, apart from that, this doesn't help to solving the first task to abort, or to, to somehow abort, automatically abort uh, any other connections, which are also there. So we need something better. And if we look at existing approaches to this, there are several of them, but I'll mention three. The first one is, the, as Tipsy was uh, doing this until Linux 4.7, uh, which is you, just to solve the neighbor monitoring problem, you set up a full mesh framework according to similar, a little similar to the, what I mentioned on the previous slide, full mesh framework of what we call links, not connections. The reason we call them links is that these are running really at, at the kernel level in a driver, and they have been running directly across L2, and nowadays also across UDP. So they're not really connections, and they're also used for more tasks than just monitoring neighbors. So this provides the generic mon neighbor monitoring service that people want in this case. Um, also, we have a sort of hierarchy so that each link endpoints keep track of all sockets on the local node having connections to the peer node, its peer node. So when it discovers that the peer node is gone, it will immediately create a number of uh, special messages, sort of fin messages, abort messages that it sends, a pseudo message that it sends up to all these, connect all these connected sockets and tell, look, you your peer is gone. You have to tear down this connection. And that is what happens. This also works fine. And this part we definitely want to retain. Uh, so, but even this, this solution has problems then uh, because of the scaling. It cannot scale much more than up to 100 nodes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the scalability here, uh, it grows by n and network load it grows by n square. Another solution that we have seen widely is a ring topology. Um, if you look at, for instance, Corosync, which is, I think, a widely used uh, cluster manager, it offers two ways of monitoring neighbors. Either, first of all, it does set up a ring. It organizes all the nodes in the cluster into a ring. Then it can I either allow each node to monitor uh, the two nearest neighbors in that ring. Uh, which scales well because it increases only by, uh, by linearly by number of nodes. Another solution that which I also offer and which is the principal, uh, the principal solution they recommend is to use uh, something they they have built in, which is called uh, the totem protocol, where they have an iterating token, a token iterating around the ring, and each node is expecting to see this token passing by at a certain rate within a certain interval. If it's missing that token, it will conclude that something is wrong. It was lost somewhere, some node went down, or there was a network problem somewhere. Then it has to track back and try to find out what happened, where was the token lost? Not necessarily a trivial task. But common to both these solutions is uh, it's very hard to handle accidental network partitioning with these solutions. It's simply so that all, to, for this to work, all nodes must know about what the, exactly what the ring looks like. They must agree on that. So you need a sort of a consensus protocol, which is not a trivial matter to, to handle this. So uh, we would provide, prefer something simpler. And also I could say all our experience, we have measured this, is that this kind of solution does not scale to more than a few dozens of nodes either. It goes without saying that when this token is iterating, the time it takes for iterating also scales linearly with the number of nodes, which means the discovery times uh, increases. Third solution, gossip, the gossip protocol. This is rather a class of protocols. There are numerous varieties of it. Uh, but a typical one and the most mostly used is that I think that you, each node chooses to 
random, by random, it selects some neighbors to actively monitor and to exchange information with those neighbors at some uh, regular, regular uh, uh, interval. Uh, and that information exchange can be about its, its neighbor, its network view, for instance. So uh, this is very simple. It scales very well. I should first explain how it works. First of all, if, if a node discovers a node loss, one of its supervised node, nodes, it will, in step one in the middle figure here, you see, it will, it will um, send out this information through this periodic update to all its known neighbors. Those neighbors, in their turn, will forward it to their own neighbors, and eventually, after X number of generations, it will reach all nodes, even in the farthest corner of the cluster. And then you see the problem with this approach. It's, it may take quite a while until it reaches all the other nodes. And uh, the number of predict the generation is unpredictable, and above all, the t time it takes before, it, before it's, uh, everybody's informed is unpredictable. And also, this uh, produces quite a lot of extra network over overhead because there will be a lot of duplicate information spreading. Nodes may receive the same information, hopefully consistent, you can't even be sure about that, from different sources because anybody receiving an information, he cannot really know what the, his neighbor has received already. So this also has weaknesses. Although it scales extremely well and it's widely used, there is a BitTorrent client called Tribler that is uh, using this. So, well working solution. Okay, so the challenge we see is really, we would like to find an algorithm that has the scalability of gossip, but with a deterministic uh, set of peer nodes, so that we know which mani how many to monitor. And uh, also, I predict, we also want to know that there is a predictable number of generations before, before, before everybody, all the other nodes are updated about the change. And this should be short. Uh, we also wanted to have the <coughs> lightweight properties of ring monitor, if possible, but less complex without the comp uh, consensus protocol and still able to handle accident accidental network partitioning. So uh, then we have the third solution, the TIPC solution, which I, we want to maintain the hierarchy, the link to socket hierarchy, because that works well. We want to also to retain the full mesh link setup between all the nodes, but we do not want to retain the full mesh active in monitoring of these links. If you can get around that, that would be nice. And the answer to this challenge we have found is this protocol which I have called overlapping ring monitoring. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, if you start from the leftmost figure here, uh, each node starts with organizing all its, no, all its known neighbors, the neighbors it discovers itself, no other neighbors, into a ring, a circular list in reality. And uh, this is based in Tipsy on uh, the numeric value of the, of the node identity, so the algorithm is the same everywhere, but we still don't expect all nodes to at any time see the same ring. They may differ, and that's, that's okay. Uh, then, that is basically the only thing we borrow from the ring supervision. On top of this, we apply something that looks a lot like a gossip protocol. We choose a subset of the neighbors, each node chooses a subset of the neighbors to monitor, actively monitor. And there are two tasks to do there. First, you need to, uh, to uh, find the optimal number of neighbors to monitor, and then you have to select it its, its members. And the first task is very simple, actually. You take the square root of the cluster size, n, and then you, that is the size of what we call the local domain. Uh, I have chosen that, that uh, term for it because I will be using that throughout the, the presentation. And then when it has done this, it has started to chose, select those, n minus one, it's actually, it, since it, it is itself included, included in the local domain, it has to monitor the n root of n minus one next nodes downstream in the ring uh, to, to monitor. 
Uh, from there on, it creates what we call a domain record, local domain record, that it sends out to all its neighbors, all nodes in the cluster, telling, I am taking responsibility for monitoring these nodes. Take it or leave it. If you don't like it, don't use it. If you find it useful, use it. Um, then, um, this is not enough, because we still need to be able to solve the task of discovering uh, a network partition. And here we use a second trick. The node selects a number of nodes outside its local domain for active monitoring. And it selects them in such a way that no node in the, in the cluster is more than two active monitoring hops away. This is what you see in the mid figure here. So you end up with, if you analyze this, you end up with another square root of n minus one nodes to monitor. And you know that whatever happens, whichever node is crashing in this cluster, you will learn about it either directly or indirectly, and uh, you can take action from there. So this solves the partitioning problem. Then we apply this on all nodes. So you end up with 2 times n times square root of n minus 1 actively monitored links which may sound a lot, but it's really, it's, it scales by n times root of n, which is a lot better than n squared, if you look at the figures here. If you look at the, the frame below the last figure here, you'll see that in a, in a, in a 16 node cluster, like the one I'm showing here, instead of having 15 times 16 nodes to monitor, or, or links to monitor links, which is 240, you end up with 96, which is a scale factor of two and a half. Uh, and if you scale up further, if you take an 800 node links, uh, 800 node cluster, which is sustainable, uh, the, the result is even more, uh, more uh, impressive. Instead of having 800 square, 640,000 links to monitor, you end up with, uh, with 44,000. And this is, uh, of course, a factor of 15, which makes a huge difference. So then they have the special cases. What happens if you lose a node? What do you do with this algorithm? Uh, the first, there are three cases in reality to, to consider. First is, if, what if you lose a node that is directly monitored within the local domain? Then you have to... Uh, uh, create this domain record that the presenter I described earlier that is describing the whole domain. Uh, it contains node identity, it contains what this node, its view on, it, this, on, its, on that node, is it up or is it down? And then it sends out this domain record to all other nodes, just like when the nodes came up, it now distributes the whole record and say it goes down, it went down, so everybody has to learn that. And it will learn that within uh, less than a half second. The thing is that when I developed this, I was, had the, the option to choose between distributing this by multicast or by some sort of, of uh, periodic update, like you do t typically in gossip. And I opted for the latter one, uh, partly before the, because the the multicast, reliable multicast service they had back then was not, could not sustain this amount of, of traffic. Now it can, but I still think this was a good solution. So what we are doing is, since after such a change, the node still has to start sending out probe messages uh, to everybody else and update all the neighbors. So you piggyback back on these probe messages, you, have, you piggyback this domain record. So everybody will learn about it within 300, default configurable value is 375 milliseconds. Within that frame, everybody will be updated. Um, also, it contains a generation ID, and this is because this probing is going across unreliable media, either UDP or L2, so it may be lost, and you don't want to, the recipient to reapply this record over and over again. You want it to discover duplicates and just discard them and it has to act that now I received I have received number generation number X and you can stop sending and it will stop sending it 
So this is the first and simplest case. Then you have a second case. What if you lose what I call a head node earlier? One of these nodes you selected outside your own domain to monitor. And you see this in the, in the first figure here. You detect by active monitoring the failure. Now you have to figure out, was this due to a network partition or was it just this node that went down? Well, you know how to handle it. You know which nodes this particular node is monitoring. It has told you it has monitoring, it is, has, it is monitoring. So you just send a quick probe message to all of those. And if they respond, everything is fine. If they don't respond, you continue the, prob the regular probing algorithm until you find that they are gone down. And uh, after that, and normally, of course, you'll find they're up. After that, you uh, recalculate this whole gossip monitoring algorithm, monitoring uh, topology, so that you, you, f you select new heads. And typically, you, of course, after such an error, you, after such a failure, you step each head in the remaining part of the ring one step forward. That's as simple as that. And it's, uh, remember, this is an entirely local operation on this node. Everybody, all, all nodes are doing this autonomously, and their topology may look <coughs> very different. Both the ring topology, although typically those will be the same, but also the, the supervision topology, monitoring topology. Third case, what happens if a node that you are not directly monitoring uh, is lost, not actively monitoring? Well, you know you can trust that there are some other nodes out there monitoring it because they have told you. So those nodes will, one after another, discover that this node was lost. They will send out their, their uh, do local domain records. So this guy, he will receive first one. After the first one, he starts actively monitoring this node, just sending out a probe. Then he would receive one more, one more. After the fourth one, he takes for granted that, yes, the node is gone. I don't need to probe anymore. I just shut it down and say it's gone. I think that this, of course, means that there is a slight theoretical risk for false positives. It may still be up, but um, I think that risk is worth taking. It's really theoretical, and normally it doesn't cause any fault, fatal problems. Uh, so, then you have, of course, what the example I've been working with and showing you so far all the way through is a nice 16-node uh, cluster. Nice square number, symmetric, full mesh, everything. Uh, that is not reality all the time, and especially not in transitional periods when, when the node is coming, cluster is coming up or when there are huge changes going on in it. So, there, there are uh, numerous cases where different nodes will have different network views, and we have to handle that. And if you analyze this, there is actually only two cases to consider. Uh, first one is that a node may have discovered a peer that nobody else is monitoring. What do you do then? You declare it a head, a domain head, and act, start actively monitoring it. And then you go on like, like normal, if it gives you a local domain that it is, uh, that is, uh, it is monitoring, you apply these to the extent possible. If there is none, you accept that it has no domain. But anyway, you continue calculating your gossip topology and choose select the next head as the first one that is not monitored by anybody else in this case. And so this is the first case. Second case is what if some nodes tells you that, yes, I'm monitoring node number seven, and I haven't discovered node number seven. I don't know anything about the number seven. What do I do then? Well, I don't apply it to my ring, because in this ring, there are only nodes that I have discovered myself. I only rely on my own discoveries, my own knowledge. What I do instead is I retain this, this um, domain record. Uh, for future use, because it's quite likely during a transit period that I will discover this node later, and then I can just reapply this, and I'm fine, and recalculate the, the topology. So those are the two simple cases you have to consider, and everything is covered. 
Um, so, what does it look like in Tipsy? If you took, take a look at the example that I've been showing all along now, uh, we have the 60 node clusters, we have these, uh, these uh, each node is monitoring a certain number of, of neighbors. It looks like, as you will see in the, in the shell here, I am on node number one. That's what you see in the first line there. And then I'm listing what each node of those nodes in the cluster have told me that, that they are monitoring and what they consider about the state of this, uh, of this node. So first of all, node number one is itself monitoring node number two, three, four. The U to the right there means this is, this is an array just reflecting. It's, we have to put this very compact because of the amount of information. So the position of these U's uh, gives which node I think is up. So the first node, the first U means node two is up. The second U means node three is up. Third one, that node four is up. Then, so those are directly monitored because they are part of the local domain. Then node number five, that is also directly monitored because I selected that to be a head node. Then I learned from the fact that node number five told me it is supervising, it's supervising number six, seven, and eight. So I don't monitor those. I rely on information from node number five and so forth. So this is as simple as it looks and in the 60 node example. And uh, yeah, it works well, fine. Now I'll show a slightly more advanced example. I have a 600 node cluster. And here you see that each node now is monitoring square root of 600 rounded downwards, of course. Uh, so it's monitoring 50 nodes each, 50 neighbors each. And you see that the arrays here are much larger than this 15. It's actually 25, sorry. So just for the sake of it, I took down one of the nodes, the 594 of this. And then you'll see, if you look at the, at the array to the right, that there is a D, uppercase D, going as a diagonal upwards to the right, which means that all these nodes were are supervising or were, are supervising node number 594, and they all think it's down. So you have this information. So when I took down this node, did it happen? Did I discover it within one second? Well, within one and a half. One and a half to two seconds. So this is where we are. And once again, these values are configurable. You can, in a smaller cluster, easily turn it down to sub-second levels if you want to. Uh, I have just been sticking to the default values. So that's where we are. Thank you. <laughs>